Hi, I'm Jason Williams, and happy to be here at the Bloody Big Drink Summit 2021, the inaugural version of this uh, really exciting range of interviews and seminars and workshops, ranging a great uh, bunch of topics. Um, I'm from Proof & Company, based in Singapore. We've got offices around Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Southeast Asia. I have the fortunate pleasure to be hosting Ben Leggett today for this session titled Gin Distillation for Geeks. Uh, a really exciting session. Uh, we're going to get a little bit geeky, but it's still going to be a little bit light, a little bit entertaining, hopefully. Um, we're talking to a, a really great distiller who makes a really great modern gin, uh, who's doing some interesting things with botanicals, but also with distillation. They're the two things that we're mostly going to talk about. Um, so I'm really happy about this session. I'm really stoked to be a part of it. It's going to take the format of Q&A. Um, just to split it up a little bit. Uh, we've got some set topics we're gonna go through um, across broadly botanicals, how they're integrated into the distillation process and then distillation specifically. We're gonna tie back that into to Ben's brand a little bit as well, but we're not here just about uh, his, his brand of gin roots. Um, but yeah, that's what the format for this session is. Looks like we're gonna go for about 45 minutes, maybe, maybe longer, who knows actually, um, but I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, quick, a little bit of information about me, why you should be listening to me talk about gin and why I'm qualified <laughs> to talk to, to a distiller. I'm clearly not a distiller. Uh, I, I'm the creative director from Proof & Company. We're uh, um, Asia Pacific's leading independent spirits company. We've got offices, like I mentioned, in, uh, all the way from China through Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we represent some of the world's greatest independent spirit brands. Uh, we also sell bar tools and os &E items. I head up our bar consultancy primarily. So I uh, run a team that conceptualizes, develops, and then launches bars and cafes, restaurants, training programs, cocktail lists, everything in between, all across all across um, Asia Pacific. Specifically to gin, I've got a little bit of history there as well. Uh, one of our big projects, something, something that's close to my heart was Atlas here in Singapore. We considered one of the world's great gin bars um, that currently got 1,380 different gins. So for about five years, I was uh, uh, for about five years I was the, the master of gin, and um, we created the Juniper Society. And I've worked with some other brands uh, on collaborations such as Four Pillars, St George, um, Terai out of India, and uh, Songhai out of Vietnam, and a few other smaller gin brands. And I also have my own gin brand called Widges Gin. So there's a small little plug, but that's not what we're here about. Just wanted to. Uh, qualify in some way why I'm here to talk about gin. I'm a massive gin nerd as well. Um, I imagine a lot of the people listening to this are as well. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I might throw over to Ben. Ben, it's great to talk to you. Um, you're coming from New Zealand. This is a global event. I'm in Singapore. You're in Marlborough and we're broadcasting to an Australian New Zealand audience. So um, great to see you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, g'day Jason. Um, equally mate, totally stoked to be part of this. Um, and great to be able to uh, start sort of um, spreading my own passion and love, which you know equally mirrors your own to uh, to a wider audience. Audience not only with our, hopefully some New Zealand viewers, but especially to our our Australian um, sort of subscribers there. So um, my name's Ben Leggett. I'm a uh, co-owner and uh, head distiller at uh, Elemental Distillers in Marlborough, um, and uh, we produce Roots Marlborough Dry Gin as our core product. We also have a range of aromatic cocktail bitters. But um, but basically, yeah, I'm a I'm like you. I'm a I'm a gin nerd. It's easy to be one when you obviously have your own distillery, produce your own product. But uh, my own background, um, apart from being a, a Kiwi, don't hold it against me, is um, I spent 14 years working in the spirits industry uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, I was that classic sort of Kiwi export who ended up uh, working in a bar, working in cocktails, worked my way up into management event bartending, became a brand ambassador for a few different premium brands from Cognacs to Whiskies, um, cocktail competitions, all the usual kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, for sort of my last four years in the UK, I was self-employed as a, um, a brand development consultant for, for premium brands doing activations and, and travel retail around Europe and still in the on-trade in the UK. So uh, it's sort of Roots is, is a bit of a double play on words. One, it's a gym brand that is proudly all about the traceability of our botanicals and our processes from pretty much uh, root to cup so that we can completely be open and honest about not only where it comes from, how it's grown, what we do with it, how we produce it. Um, 
but uh, also a bit of a story of, of me coming back to my roots and taking with me my sort of experience and exposure to the spirits industry and trying to have a go at doing it for myself, really. So we are about two and a half years in, and uh, we've uh, obviously encountered a few fun challenges along the way with COVID, but um, at the same time, we're, we're up and out. We're growing at a rate that we're really happy with. And uh, despite the weather today not representing, we're located right in the heart of Mulberry's grape growing um, wine region. We're surrounded on two sides by, by vineyards. So there are definitely worse places to be at the same time. That's sensational. I like how you've just got this beautiful, cheeky, sweeping view of vineyards behind you there. That's really nice. Uh, yeah, really, really excited for you and um, really love the brand. Um, there's two things there that I particularly love, which is not specifically what we're going to talk about today, but is the fact that you've come through so many different roles in the, the yeah. bar and liquor industry. I think that's testament to the uh, dynamic nature of our industry. People can go from bartender to distiller um, and maybe in an operational capacity or sales capacity or marketing capacity or education. It's really exciting. So I think that's a little bit of inspiration for, for me up here in Singapore. And the second part of it is, it, is the, um, the the inspiration behind your brand and the ingredients, which we're going to go into a little bit. Um, but there's some really interesting botanicals and flavor combinations that you're working with there. And that sense of place um, is really exciting. So, um, yeah, great to, uh, great to chat and um, we'll, we'll get into it. Great. So um, what we're going to talk about today and um, some of the outcomes, we're going to split this into two different sections. First section, broadly about botanicals, obviously pretty key to, to a gin. Um, but then we're going to talk about distillation. You're going to take us on a little tour of the distillery and show us uh, what, you're, what you're working with. Um, I guess the outcomes, what would be a learning outcome for anyone who's listening to this? Get a good grasp of um, what we call it chemical compounds, and um, and we're going to refer to these terpenoids that um, make up the flavour and aroma of the raw materials that go into gin. We're going to define what those are, what the botanicals are, and how they play with each other, um, and then go through the thought process around why you spoke, why you chose your botanicals. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of juniper, of course, in gin. We're going to talk about how those raw materials then get integrated into the spirit and then and then what happens during the distillation process and then segue into the actual distillation, um, the apparatus, the different variables, um, the different kinds of stills, how that can be then used from, by different distillers, um, and then talk about a few of your little fun, quirky challenges or opportunities that you've discovered through your journey over the last two years of making a gin in the middle of the vineyards in, in Marlborough. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and like I said, we should go for maybe about 40, 35 minutes from this point onwards, um, but super exciting. So let's get into it. Do it. So first topic, botanicals. Um, first point is let's, let's set some context and let's talk about juniper. Let's understand mm. what juniper is. I'll throw over to you. Um, as a, a, a bartender, educator, Brand ambassador now distiller. Um, tell us what is juniper, I guess, to start off with. Let's start slowly here. This is for geeks, but let's start slowly. What is juniper um, and what is the importance to gin? Yeah, um, I guess the, the, the best way to answer what is juniper um, from our, particularly from our perspective, is juniper is gin and gin is juniper. It is the only thing that we kind of have to grasp and hold on to in the definition of gin. You know, subjective to all of the muddiness of its legal definitions in the US or the, or the European Union and individual countries and how we decide to acknowledge it. It's the one thing we have. So if there is juniper somewhere near the spirit, um, it can basically be called a gin. Um, so it is the heart of everything. What we choose to add on top of the, the juniper or how we choose to utilize the juniper in distillation or, or, or other methods um, it starts breaking down the sort of the geeky detail from there, but basically 101, gin is juniper, juniper is gin. And um, I personally would love to see more distillers and more marketing companies behind gin brands wax lyrical more about the juniper. You know, we're all super obsessed with our with our coffee. You know, we all love our flat whites in, in Australasia. We're all very proud of our single origin coffee. How often have you heard gin brands talk about single origin juniper? How often have you heard these gin brands talk about proudly where it's grown, how it's harvested, how fresh it is, what they do with it. 
if that is the one thing we have to define the category, and predominantly it makes up the majority of a single gin's recipe by volume, why aren't we talking more about juniper instead of these rogue crazy flowers that are harvested by blind virgins with one leg in the steeps of Mongolia with their teeth, you know, like these lovely marketing stories where they really grasp on these crazy rogue botanicals and they love to sort of build a story around it. Whereas, you know, 90% of the flavor is still possibly coming from juniper. So that's hey, my short answer to that question. <laughs> I, like, I like it. I like it more. So you're saying it'd be good to see more terroir and more messaging around where the juniper comes from. Because at the moment, I think most, a lot of bartenders have been through any gin education would know it's juniper is communist and it comes from Macedonia or Italy and it's probably bought from a two or three different massive vendors in in Europe um, but there are some gins out there that are using more different varietals like from mm. and stuff like that sure. um, but you just mentioned um, taste and aroma what does juniper smell like taste like what is the effect that it has on gin so juniper is a once you dive into the detail of it it's 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 incredibly dynamic it really does change a lot i think as a stereotype you know we look at juniper and we identify it from its kind of roots as a conifer plant so it has this really big resinous piney kind of delivery to it but when you start getting into really fresh juniper and some of the single origin stuff you definitely do notice terroir influences fresh juniper if you can get hold of it even if it has been um, quite recently fumigated for export, it still can have these enormous amounts of fruit characteristic to them as well. You know, mm. juniper, if it hasn't been dried too much, has a huge amount of flesh on the outside and that flesh can still carry quite a lot of sweet fruity elements. So while yes, there is this piney resin element to them, the more complex and, and uh, more exciting juniper can deliver so much more on top of it. They even have slight uh, lemon notes to them. They have a lot of dried straw. They have balsamic elements. They have, um, you know, uh, lots of earthy, barky notes. So they, they have this complexity of different flavors and aromas that are possible. Um, it very much does come down to the way that the distiller chooses to utilize them and also the origin and the freshness of the botanical in itself. Super interesting. I've never heard of people talking to so much about the variants in the um, flavor or aroma characteristics of juniper um, never never do a little bit because they um, they use it three different times throughout their three different ways throughout their production process and they like to think it brings out different elements of it but um, when I'm talking to guests um, we, we always talk about juniper having yeah, piney resinous um, you know it's a little bit woody a little bit citrusy um, forest floor kind of characteristic but you, what you're saying is that there's so much more to come out of it um, there's some fruity flavors and some, some sweet vegetal flavors as well yeah massively and a lot of it does come down to how you distill um, you know if you are a pure vapor basket distilled gin you're almost like capturing those flavors all blended together but if you are doing pot macerated or single shot runs you know you can taste the expressive transition of flavors throughout a single run you know transitioning from the heads through the hearts and tails you just see these massive different levels at which specific flavor chemicals sort of extract mm. and so you can start picking together or deconstructing rather the complexity of the way a single botanical can go um, there is you know there, there's a few companies that are doing exciting things um, atom brands who have master of malt um, produced quite a few years ago you know when they got their hands on a rotovat they produced a range of single origin juniper that they sourced from i think about eight or nine different samples and they distilled them under the under a vacuum in the same condition and then they bottled them and it was it's a fantastic sort of you know discovery purely of the differences in the different origins and the different ways in which juniper can express so yeah i'd love that i'd love to love to try those it's an interesting um process mm. um what we wanted to talk about today was terpenoids um and i wanted to bring that back to the juniper comment or the juniper conversation um what are terpenoids and within juniper, for example, what are the predominant terpenoids? You mentioned citrus qualities. We've talked about woody qualities. Um, so maybe mm. define for us what terpenoids are and what we're getting out of juniper um, in that context. And then we'll go down that path. Yeah, righto. So uh, terpenoids <laughs> are, um, <laughs> start with the easy question. Terpenoids are a, um, uh, it's, it's a chemical hydrocarbon, basically, that allows us to um, use modern scientific equipment to um, identify a particular concentration of a flavoring chemical within a organic matter. So you can take any, any organic 
you know, uh, botanical you wish, and you could run it through a very complex um, uh, sort of uh, sensory system, which can allow for a machine to list in its sort of parts per million the volumes of these particular flavoring chemicals. So if you take something like juniper that has a huge amount of complexity, um, and we know that it predominantly has this piney element to it, and surprisingly, the most dominant, on average, um, flavoring terpenoid in a uh, juniper is called alpha pining, and pining represents exactly its namesake, this piney resinous character. There is also a, a large volume of another one called lemonine, and lemonine, like its namesake, also expresses those sort of citrus-born characters. The way terpenoids are probably easy to consider is anything that you sort of put in your mouth, whether it be a food or a solid, um, as soon as you are chewing it, you're digesting it, you're breathing through it. Um, every time that you say smell an aroma, this invisible chemical, pining, lemonine, whichever it may be, is literally carried through your olfactory. And as soon as it connects with your olfactory glands, the receptor from that chemical influencing a memory in your brain allows you to say, oh, yeah, that's citrus, that's a lemon character, or that's a green pepper character, or that's a, a, a fruity floral character. So we kind of regard terpenoids as a bit of a, uh, a roadmap to understanding flavor in almost a, a physical way. And uh, obviously, it's very difficult because we don't all have access to the same geeky equipment, but a lot of this information is on the public domain. and um, and. Uh, understanding the way specific botanicals might have a concentration in a particular area allows us to understand perhaps where certain flavors might be heading when we distill them off um, as a distiller. I mean, it is geeky, but once you do familiarize with yourself with some of these terms, they do make sense. So another another uh, one is limonene. Is that yeah. pronouncing that correctly? Limonene, yeah. And, um, um, the interesting thing is uh, this citrus quality or woody quality or floral quality um, are not necessarily coming from citrus, something woody or something like a flower or something floral. And so we're using these um, terpenes, the terpenoids that are um, basically um, flavor descriptors or tasting notes for the actual botanicals. And so you could use a couple of different ter terpenoids to describe what we're getting from juniper or coriander seed or angelica, um, and which I think is quite interesting for a gin distiller as they're approaching their recipe or their botanical build, but also a bartender could could actually use these their terms or um, chemical compounds such as a alpha pinene or limonene or geraniol and the whole different range. We're going to be putting up some graphs through this presentation um, <laughs> so people know what the hell we're talking about. But a bartender could use this as a framework to create a martini list, for example, or they could use it as, as a way to actually even de decide what gins to stock in their bar. You know, maybe, you know, like a Gordon's, <laughs> yeah. for, Gordon's for example, has loads of that alpha pining. It's just a big ball of juniper. Never, never obviously is the same. But then something a bit more crazy and modern that's got lots of fruit or fresh citrus in their, in their distillation process might have a lot more of the the floral, fruitier um, terpenoids going on there as well. So it's an interesting way, I guess, for a gin distiller yeah. to approach how they want their gin to taste and smell based upon choosing the botanicals and what they're going to get out of it, what ratios to use. Um, and I'm talking to a distiller here, so correct me if I'm wrong. But I guess the bartender and educator can use it when they're creating drinks lists or talking to their guests about cocktails and stuff like that. And they, there could even be a graphical way to represent that in menus and and um, and presented in training programs and whatnot. Yeah, it's a fascinating way to just almost like change the perspective in which you approach um, flavors, especially ar aromatics. Um, you know, terpenes are really, really responsible for a flower delivering a certain pungent aroma. And, you know, from a nature point of view, that flower has developed that predominant terpenoid aromatic so that it either attracts bees to help pollination or even to detract pests from eating it, um, you know, as a form of sort of soft pesticide. So, you know, terpenoids, once you do get into them, and obviously it's a, it's a rabbit hole of geekiness, but it, it definitely can kind of change the way you might approach flavors and aromas. And obviously all of that ties in extremely well with bartending and creating cocktails. And, okay. and uh, yeah, especially more and more as com cocktails are getting complex and people are using more fresher local forage botanicals, it definitely opens up a whole new world, that's for sure. You know, like the, 
Uh, Vernon Chalker, who um, created Gin Palace in Melbourne in the late 90s, passed away last year. He said that um, gin, and I agree with him, a lot of people do, listening to this, of course, said that gin is the, the world's greatest cocktail spirit. You know, the two greatest cocktails in the world are the gin and tonic and the dry gin martini. Because you change the gin in each of those cocktails, it completely changes the drink. Huge those difference, natural, yeah, yeah. Those natural materials, those natural ingredients. Um, so the gin distiller is making their recipe with these natural ingredients, and then the bartender is using the same kind of flavour descriptors and aroma descriptors, and these, mm. now we're talking mm. about delving underneath that into these chem- chemical descriptions to, to create cocktails as well, which is really exciting. It's taking that, that, to, that, that, that to another level. Um, the industry that's um, that's definitely jumping on terpenoids the most from a fashionable point of view, and hopefully will definitely you know cross pollinate into into spirits and distilling is is funnily enough the the hemp industry you know the whole explosion of um, CBD oils and concentrated you know uh, hemp related products um, medicinal or otherwise and so you know I think hopefully people will start googling terpenes and terpenoids and some of the greatest visual sort of infographics that are available at the moment to help explain. The individual plants, the botanicals, the dominant sort of flavour terpenoids that are expressing them are actually in the in the hemp sort of industry. So, it, it is hard to find stuff more specific to distilling than spirits, but at least it's out in the public domain now, and um, hopefully it'll it'll be something more and more people will be geeking out on. <laughs> well, um, we'll we'll, we'll uh, make sure that we add our contact details at the end of this, and um, yeah, for sure that we'll, we'll be putting up a couple of graphics that people should be able to see it throughout this conversation as well. It's funny you mentioned the hemp industry and, and the you know, cannabis industry. I quite often will um, use that as a, an, some kind of way to describe the flavour and aroma of juniper, particularly really resinous juniper. Hops, you know, sweet woods or citrus, um, and sometimes I might say, you know, cannabis, but um, not in Singapore, where I currently am right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we use, um, we use uh, hops, uh, a really nice, you know, hops that we get every single vintage harvested fresh from just over the hill for great our gin segue. and you know, great segue. do you like the way I did that just sort of flowed that one in and um but uh you know and and hops you know part of it is part of the same family as hemp and they both have this predominant mercing terpenoid and so the predominant flavor of that grassy earthy um sort of uh you know hoppy hempiness is from mercine and then ours is a citric hops so it's also high in lemonine and you start seeing this again this flavor map come back together but yeah, it's yeah. I just subtly put that one in there. Too. No, no, I love that because I, I love how you pull out a botanical and it can have different terpenes. So you've mentioned yep. um, myrcene and limonol comes from the same, same botanical. I can start to think about how I can create a cocktail from that straight away. I'm sure you've already done it many times. Um, hops and lemon, all those qualities go really well together, mm. and, and you've already created that in the gin, so you can build upon that from a chemical level into a ingredient level in the bar like I am now. So, yeah, really love that. Um, so let's come back to roots. Can you tell me about the actual botanicals that go into it? Uh, we're not here to just talk about roots, of course, but I think it would be yeah. remiss of us not to. So maybe you could talk, talk us through the botanicals because I find them really interesting. Um, and also come back to this discussion we're having around looking at botanicals on a chemical level and talk about some of your decision-making process on, in that context. Yeah, no worries. Well, here's one I made earlier. So, uh, so our roots multiple dry gin is basically, uh, you know, we're proudly about our botanicals. So we've literally drawn or had illustrated on our label, um, sort of the roots and the barks and the flowers, and you know, try to be anatomically correct. But, but basically, we've got six botanicals. Um, we have a wild forest North Macedonian juniper, which we have to import ourselves, which is a bloody nightmare and cost a fortune. But it's just, you know, is about seventy percent. 70 to 75 percent by botanical mass of our single recipe so 70 percent of our entire flavor comes from one botanical we're going to spend the most time and money on it so we're very proud of that um we get that in around about twice a year so we keep a degree of freshness we have full foraging traceability um documentation that comes from our suppliers um it's actually uh, harvested hand harvested um by an amazing uh, father and son business in east sussex in england and they literally go to macedonia and they forage it with local farmers, bring it back to fumigate it for export and pack it up in the UK, and then we get that direct. So very, very proud of our juniper. Um, and then we've got um, uh, coriander seed, which we get from New Zealand. In fact, the remaining ingredients, with the exception of juniper, all come from New Zealand. 
and they're all seasonal. So we're a big believer in getting our botanicals as fresh as possible so that they have just much more to give in the final spirit and distillate. Mm. Um, so we've got coriander seed from the Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. We have um, grapefruit peel, uh, which we get 600 kilograms um, at one weekend every year from a single orchard in, Hawks, in, in Gisborne in New Zealand. We then hold an event called the Great Annual Grapefruit Appeal, and we hand peel 600 kgs in one afternoon of gin, live music, low and slow brisket barbecue and smoked pork belly um, with the local uh, local volunteers, which is a lot of fun. Um, the uh, And then we have, um, so that's three. And then we've got um, native kawakawa berries, which we get wild forage from um, uh, sort of around Canterbury and some of the Kapiti coast of New Zealand. We have um, uh, wild gorse flower, which is a massive pest in New Zealand. But again, we host this amazing event with a local four wheel drive club, take all these volunteers up into uh, the Mulberry hillside to pick all the gorse flowers. Then we um, free, uh, dehydrate that in house, put them in thermal vacuum bags, and we have that fresh for our, for our distillation. And then the last one is, um, what am I missing? Uh, Hops, gorse flower, of course, yeah. It's not gorse flower, the, the hops, and then the hops from overseas. So six botanicals, um, all annoyingly sourced seasonally every year um, so that we can hopefully have enough volume for the remaining season um, to come. Yeah, so, wow. yeah. Okay, a, little, a couple of little questions there to dive into. <laughs> um, that's why I love, I love, there's a mix of there of like a sense of place with your botanicals, which I think gins also can do. We've talked about terroir with wine or in wine country, great little tie-in. Um, and there has been a bit of, a, I guess, a rise and rise of native gins or um, gins with provenance or some kind of terroir. There's also, we have St. George terroir and the bar behind me, which is a great right. representation of like Northern California and they do a bit of foraging and, um, and we've seen a huge amount of gins coming from Southeast Asia, for example, and South Asia that have ethnobotanicals in their in their mix there, which actually have deep meaning to their communities and, and you know, culture. Um, and you also, you have some of that as well. I remember Kawakawa I first came across in South Gin. I think South Gin was before its time, you know, like 20. Gosh, yeah, that's 42 below. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So 15 years ago, they were talking about native, you know, Maori botanicals like kawakawa and manuka berries. Mm. What the hell mm. is that? So, what is, I'm going to start with kawakawa. What is kawakawa? What does it smell and taste like? It's a native New Zealand pepper, basically. Oh, it's part of the pepper family. Um, it's uh, the kawakawa berry is actually very, very closely related with the Indonesian and long pepper, which they use in Southeast Asia for cooking. And it literally looks like, uh, like a crazy little long. Got it. Uh, pepper like that. So in um, in Southeast Asian cuisine, they literally grind that down and use that as a pepper. It's highly, highly aromatic. It has an enormous amount of different terpenoids in it. So we're still kind of exploring and discovering the different sort of flavors and aromatics that can come out through a single run. Um, but uh, the leaf is the thing that is most commonly used in New Zealand. It's used in loose leaf teas and the likes. And there's quite a number of New Zealand gins that use kawa kawa. Um, the leaf is an evergreen. Um, and it's available in every single part of the coastline of New Zealand. So you can get it anytime you like. We've just gone with the fruit. It's only available for two months of the year. It is a favorite food source for one of our native pigeons. So it's a bloody nightmare to harvest. But, um, but once you do capture it and you do uh, dehydrate it, it just concentrates, turns dark and concentrates. These incredibly strong, slightly peppery, slightly chilly, but almost, um, we kind of call it like ginger fruit cake. It's got this mixture of kind of like all spice in it, and then also has these slight kind of uh, menthol uh, ginger pepper notes. So love yeah, that. we we're in love with it. We think it's incredible. Um, and the the is it horse flower or gorse flower that you mentioned? Gorse that flower, that? yeah, yeah. So the gorse flower, um, we actually just posted a um uh, a pretty cool video that shows exactly what we do and how we forage our gorse flowers today. So that's available on our on our social media. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, it's a tiny little yellow flower that grows on what could be called a hawthorn bush, so a big, horrible, spiky bush. And it was uh, introduced to New Zealand with our first settlers you know, a couple hundred years ago uh, to use as a form of hedging for livestock. Um, and it just took, it went nuts. And uh, it's the only place in the world where it flowers twice a year. And um, it has exploding seed pods, so it, it grows like like uh, like a nightmare. So it is one of our biggest pests for that reason because it's so prolific. 
Um, but uh, outside of that, it, it, the flour itself, when it's fresh, has this immense coconut um, and uh, dried banana element to it. So we have a lot of fun to try to pick the volumes that we require for the year. Um, and, uh, but when we dehydrate that, um, again, it sort of concentrates that dried banana element, almost carries over with some dried straw and becoming this chamomile crossover. So we love it as a botanical because it's not super pretty. It's not too potpourri. Um, it still delivers a high aromatic profile, but almost opens up this slight tropical chamomile element, which we really enjoy. Nice. I love the way you describe that. Um, it's interesting, you know, you've got these, I would say exotic because I've never heard of them before and they're, you know, they're, whether it's a pest or whether it's actually native and endemic to New Zealand, some exotic botanicals going on there and you've really described them in quite a appealing and exotic way. And it's interesting that juniper still makes up 70% of your actual botanical mix, which goes to show like if you want to be a, a gin, particularly a dry gin, you can have some yeah. modernity, you can have some exoticism, you can have some provenance and sense of place but you're still going to have a shitload of juniper in there to really make it a That's strong right. gin, right. right? Yeah. Interesting. So um, to take that in further, so we've talked a little bit about um, the you know, dry botanicals. Juniper is obviously the, the key ingredient here. We've touched on some of the other key important ones, coriander seed, um, angelica, for example. Then we've talked about the chemical compounds and how you can describe them from a chemical level as opposed to just like a more of a descriptive level. Um, Mersin is an important one for you particularly and I think for a lot of gins where it's giving that herbal um, grassiness. Then you've got limonene which is giving more bright citrus qualities. Then you've got alpha pinene which is what comes from the juniper and to a lesser extent coriander seed, carbon pods um, and how there's actually no citrus in a lot of the gins but you're getting a lot of limonene and, and how we're getting a lot of these characteristics from botanicals. Um, but how do we actually then uh, incorporate these natural ingredients, the flavours and these terpenoid characteristics that we're talking about? How do we actually integrate that into the liquid? Uh, a lot of people that are listening to this will already know that, or well, they would have heard at least, that gin is basically flavoured vodka with these natural ingredients, juniper and other botanicals. But um, I thought maybe we could start through the production process now and talk about maceration. So uh, what is maceration? Um, what is the general industry standard for like a classic, say, London dry gin? Um, and maybe how do you approach it? Yeah, great question. So um, I guess traditional London dry gins, uh, you know, when you talk about traditional or classic, which, you know, you're both kind of generally implying a period of history. You've, you're implying something that happened a lot, a long time ago. So um, going backwards, we're talking about, you know, pot stills, traditional, putting all your botanicals into a big boiler, leaving them for a period of time or not, but basically distilling them in a single shot altogether. So what we're getting more and more these days is the industry is almost um, creating its own classifications, which is allowing both people in the industry as well as you know, judges and, and spirits competitions to identify kind of these subgroups of, of gins. So we have what we call single shot and multi shot, which we'll touch on, I imagine, later on. Um, but a classic style would be putting all your botanicals into a boiler together over the top of some spirit not always some neutral spirit, but some spirit, and then distilling everything together and then capturing as much as you want from that. So um, today with a, a much greater understanding of, of still types um, and ways in which we can focus flavors, um, we're seeing obviously hybrid stills and we're seeing Carter head stills, vapor baskets, and we're seeing people incorporating stripping plates and bubble plates and even creating their own neutral spirits. So there's quite a, yeah, quite a big area there, but I'd say classically, you're talking about a single shot um, pot still gin where all the botanicals go in. And what's developed from that is additional maceration. So for leaving a your botanicals steeping in the ethanol or the alcohol for a certain period of time. You know, the standard rule of thumb for a lot of modern gins is a 24 hour period. We see that with brands like Beefy to 24 proudly promoting that as you know part of their, their brand story for that expression. <clears throat> but most crafties these days who are doing um, single shot, especially pot still gins, are macerating for an average of 24. Some people do it much longer, some do it shorter, and some people also um, add heat during that period of, um, of maceration. I believe that's what um, Sip Smith do. Um, and uh, we've definitely played around with that. Our first expressions were all about what we call activating the macerate. So when we kind of add that almost flash infusion at the start, 
and then turn the heat off, you know, it still sits for 24 hours, but because it's had that flash infusion, you've almost accelerated the interaction or the rate of that maceration process. So um, it has pros and cons um, with everything, um, but um, one of the classic areas that, you know, maceration can, can bring is just arguably a huge, a, a bigger level of complexity basically in gins. And a lot of people attribute that to complexities in length. So how long a certain botanical profile or transition or integration of botanicals can last in a spirit if it has had time to delicately macerate. So what we talk about between maceration and infusion is basically one has heat and one doesn't. So maceration is done at an ambient temperature which is much more delicate on botanicals, much more delicate on fruits, especially and, and flowers, and is allowing the chemicals, the sugars, the resins, the acids even inside those botanicals to slowly and delicately extract out into a liquid over a period of time compared to just chucking it in, turning the heat on and trying to flash, to kind of like extract all of those flavors. So maceration definitely has a huge advantage, I believe, in, in adding complexity to a gin, but from a practical point of view, adds a lot of time, adds a lot of cost, and it's another one of those things that needs to be balanced and weighed up um, for any business, really. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people that do have a base knowledge about gin might not have might not have put too much thought into the maceration, probably put more thought into the, the shiny stills or the forage, but, <laughs> but, but they, uh, that maceration process is really important, and a couple of little analogies or comparisons that I liked or I, I automatically go to is um, steeping tea, different yeah. teas, different yeah, teas require different true. temperatures and different amounts of time um, um, and you can totally mess it up you know, really quickly for you over, over brew it, over steep it. Um, and also I always think about uh, the delicate nature of the, the, some of the botanicals versus the robust nature of some of the botanicals. For example, um, Juniper and some of the other hard botanicals, you know, you could probably heat them up and you can probably put them in really high strength alcohol and do it for a long time and then they're going to be generally okay. Actually, a bit more time is going to bring out the the, um, the the characteristics a little bit more, but something maybe like a dried flower or something that's a little bit more delicate or maybe some of these powders, um, if you heat them up or if you let them steep for too long, um, could get a negative effect, something bitter or something a little bit funky that you might not like. So I think there's a lot of care and effort and um, diligence that's required to determine what your maceration process, is that correct? Yeah, oh, 100%. And and again, there's no one answer to everything. You know, it's nice for, for especially for us, you know, as, as bartenders or people front of house working in sales or otherwise to go, this gin is made this way. You know, they take their botanicals, they put it in the pot, they macerate of 24 hours, which people love, and then they distill it and they capture it, you know, and then all this gin is done in a vapor basket and they put all their botanicals in there. But I think that most, I'd like to think that most of us, especially in the, the new movement of, of distilling, where people are incorporating a little bit of each or a little bit of this and that relative to their botanical understanding and relative to the way it expresses. So we don't put all of our botanicals in the macerate. We only put four of them in. But one of those four, which is our hops, we don't macerate. We put in the day of the distilling. So three of the four are macerated. One of them is put in the day off because if that's macerated, the hops just gets, I mean, it's so bitter, right? It's so intense. It's overloaded. It doesn't need the maceration. And then the others go into the vapor basket. And there's a reason why we select a different process for a different action for a different reaction and um and ultimately that's all about sort of pulling the whole picture together at the end of the day what you want people to be able to taste in your in your bottle yeah. so it's pretty learning and understanding of distillation and the access to hybrid stills has allowed us much more freedom than the classic sort of pot shot so yeah yeah and i mean you know that we just gin included is is that classic uh, pot shot which is everything goes into a huge pot still gets heated up and there's a bit of romance about that as well. You know, that's the old Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 very much so. Uh, and yeah. I, um, I love standing in the distillery and the distiller, the master distiller would say, can you smell that? That's the coriander seed starting to, to, to go. Ah, oh, it's awesome. It's nothing like it. Absolutely. Yeah. Two, two hours later, yeah. he'd, he'd stop and say, can you smell that? Now, <laughs> yeah. the, car, now the cardamom is starting to come through. And the whole place kind of smelled like you know, breakfast or cereal or stewed fruits or yeah, something at yeah. different times, he could just smell the that that macerate was now starting to heat up. Yeah, really cool. And it's just like making infusions or, or um, you know, incorporating flavour into spirits in a, in a bar context as well. You know, we used to do the same thing. If we wanted to speed up the process with an infusion, we'd put it in the, the 
dishwasher or something. And the dishwasher, <laughs> that's right, yeah. That's <laughs> right. Put, put your, uh, put your um, vodka infusion in the mid-2000s on top of the coffee yeah. machine or in the microwave. Sitting on the top of the ice machine, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a comparison there if you want to kind of apply some heat to kind of speed up your maceration or your, your infusion. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Super cool. Hey, um, what about luching? Let's touch on luching. We are we get, we're getting a bit of a flow here. We're got, probably going to go over time a little bit, but quickly define for us what luching is. Does it apply to your gin? It does with some others. For example, I've used Never Never already. They use a, a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of juniper in three different ways. Mm. Um, what is luching and what does it come from? Yeah, so luching is a, um, is a hydrophobic reaction that happens between specific oils that express from botanicals that literally just don't like water. Um, they're not completely, um, uh, basically it's, a, it's, a, it's where an oil, as you can imagine, is not miscible or it doesn't easily mix into water because of its different density. So oils are extracting through botanical distillation all the time, but there's a small volume of them that just react with water. So the more water they have, the more they separate out. And in doing so, you start seeing this cloudy opaque effect uh, carry through. The best example to describe Lucian to um, uh, to anybody is to get them to understand pastis or absinthe. You know, generally when it comes in a bottle that is clear, or you know, we'd like to think it would be clear. It's a, it's a standard spirit that's been distilled from a, a lot of botanicals. The majority being aniseed, and aniseed is one of the most loose reactive single botanicals that kind of are available. And any time you add water to a glass of pastis, it immediately clouds up and turns opaque. So we get the same reaction basically with, with gin because we deal with multiple different botanicals. Some botanicals are, are more classic culprits for lucian than others. Citrus peel is a big one. Um, juniper it definitely is, is also a big influencer. And especially if you're dealing with a recipe like ours that has a 70 you know, or even higher percentage um, of you know, botanical volume of juniper, then you're you're going to potentially see a lot of those oils carrying through. There are also production choices that turn it up even more a focus it. So if we're doing a maceration of our juniper for 24 hours, if we're choosing to heat that maceration, say like an activated maceration, and then we do a single pot shot, we are concentrating a huge amount of the flavoring congeners and those oils in a single shot run that can and generally do create a very oily and possibly loose gin. Loose does come out though predominantly at the sort of earlier half of the run. So again, depending on your heart cut, you can sort of mitigate it a little bit. But there's no doubt about it. If you have big oily gins and you want to control it, um, there are lots of different techniques, but generally it comes from one predominant botanical and then it might come from the fact that you've got it in a boiler and you're doing a single shot. Um, vapor basket gins are much more controllable on loose. Um, what has happened though is you've got this sort of new school, old school conflict going on where uh, you, know, you can get to very heated discussions about whether louche is uh, an imperfection in distilling or whether it is um, something that actually should be a little bit embraced more. You can chill filter your gin to remove that oily content very easily, but in removing it, you're literally removing a high concentration of flavor and aroma. So, you know, what's more important to you, delivering the best flavor balance and aromatic profile in your gin to a consumer or delivering something that sells the drink, you know, yeah. with a clear liquid. So. As always, there are scales you can definitely go overboard, um, but often, you know, more and more, there are distilleries that are proudly putting on their bottles or on their website that, hey, look, if you put our gin in the fridge, it'll, you know, congeal those oils more and it might go a bit cloudy, don't be afraid of it. Or if you mix ours with, ours with tonic and dilute it, it might take a slight blue hue, don't be afraid of it. It's oils that we're proudly keeping in our gin. So it's a, yeah, it's a great discussion for distillers. We, we proudly, Hashtag embrace the louche, but again, like with everything, you can go too far with it as well. So, That's yeah. Interesting. That's, uh, I, it's, it does remind me of the whiskey industry and the discussion with single malt or, or, or you know, Scotch yeah. whiskey around um, chill filtration. I think that's yes. over now. I don't think people care as much anymore, particularly in like in, in bars, maybe in a retail space, it might be more important. But having non chill filter on the bottle um, is, is a brand saying that they're proud to to be non-chilled filtered, I think that the, the effect could be negligent compared to the effect that gin has. So if you're filtering gin, you're going to be filtering out a lot of that oil and a lot of that condensed kind of flavour. That's right. That's um, right. Not, yeah. Chill filtration in the whiskey industry is probably not going to have as big an impact as chill filtration in gin, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we don't want to go down the world of being that kind of 
boring and geeky like Scotch whiskey. Uh, there is some gin freaks now, like there's whiskey freaks, but I guess we don't want to be like vodka, we don't want to be like Scotch. <laughs> No, but it's also, you know, we're in a world where uh, hazy IPAs are becoming the new, you know, it's not about having the golden tears of a lager anymore. It's it's about getting that cloudy glass of pale ale. It's um it's a world of natural wines and, and yeah. funky results and unfiltered, proudly unfiltered sort of, you know, Chardonnay. So it's, yeah, it, people are just exploring or challenging, you know, old expectations or old guidelines. And I, I kind of embrace that. But at the same time, just because it's different doesn't mean it's better. Um, I believe people still need to understand why something is one way. And if they choose to produce a product that is cloudy, they should proudly embrace it um, and, and own that as, as a decision of their production, not just because it's fashionable. So Yeah, yeah. I guess hence, hence the importance of talking about botanicals and it's a, it's a good marketing tool, but also it helps educate consumers or guests when they've got a gin that's yeah. really loose. They're not going to think yeah. it's poorly produced, or they're not going to think it's been right. stored, in, stored in correct or something yeah. like that. Yeah, super interesting. Okay, cool. Well, that was our botanical part of the discussion. Um, we're going to uh, do a little cheeky um, set change, I guess you could call it, um, and we'll talk about uh, distillation. Does that sound? Cool. Let's do it. All right. So uh, the next section of um, our discussion today, uh, gin distillation for geeks as part of the Bloody Big Drink Summit 2021, bit of a mouthful, is uh, distillation. So we want to now segue into distillation. We've talked about botanicals and we've talked about the, some of the ways that we can describe the botanicals from a chemical level. We've talked about how to, to uh, incorporate the flavour through maceration. Uh, um, we're going to talk about distillation, but before we get to that, we just ended uh, the last topic by talking about luching. And um, Ben, you've actually got a little example for us. Yes, no better way than to show it. So this is a, a small little, you see it's a glass of some clear liquid. This is a collection of uh, highly concentrated oils that we've taken from a pot run. And if I add a little bit of water to it, we should see wow. an immediate clouding up. So that's a very extreme example of the way luching works. And uh, with the right amount of botanical concentration, you can get it. I mean, the nose is amazing. There's just no doubt about it. I wish I could share it. What's it smell but, like? Um, it uh, smells very much like like lemon blossoms. It's like really floral, but has that very dominant citrus profile. And that's because lemonine, the citrus profile, has a low boiling point and comes out very early on in the gin distillation. So we do see a lot more of that citrus character towards the heads cut of a gin run. So it's fascinating to see that come out in that way, yeah. There you go. Ben is natural, natural habitat here. Yeah. All right, so distillation. Um, yeah. So, yeah, let's quickly define gin. So gin, we, we take a neutral grain spirit, grain neutral spirit, uh, and then we're basically applying flavour to that and redistilling it, and there's 1,001 different ways that that can happen, like we've touched on. We're going to go into it a little bit more. Um, we want to talk about um, the apparatus and um, how the apparatus is used, basically. We've only got 10 minutes or something, but we want to quickly talk about what that stuff is and how it works. Yeah, um, cool. How, how Roots does it specifically, a couple of different kinds of stills and different different variations. Um, and then we want to talk about multi-shot versus single shot except versus blended versus compound, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, pretty exciting. You've got this beautiful little piece of kit behind you to talk about. I guess the, the first question is, um, what does a classic gin still look like and what is different about yours? Lovely. So classic gin still, as we were defining earlier, is probably that traditional pot. It's just a pot that has a beautiful big boiler to it that you put in your liquid, your neutral spirit. You add your botanicals. You either seat them or macerate them for a period of time or not. But then you heat up that pot like a pot of water. Um, and then when it hits the boiling point of alcohol, which is lower than water, it literally has a rolling boil uh, like a pot of water on a stove. But instead of water vapor coming up, it's now concentrated aromatic vapor, which is high in alcohol and traps a lot of those lovely flavors from the botanicals. It then travels straight from your boiler up into a condenser where it gets cooled and condensed back down into a liquid and collected. So mm -hmm. standard sort of distilling 101. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And I have to ask, so tell us about what the, the setup that you've got is and what makes it a bit different yeah. than you just described. So we, we definitely got a humble little little distilling setup, but we absolutely love it. This is a 200 litre hybrid copper pot still. 
Um, hybrid stills are the, the fashionable choice these days with a lot of people opening up into the gin distilling industry, even into the rum sector, because it allows us to incorporate not only the classic pot, but we could also integrate a column and if we wish, a vapor basket. So we have all three of these put into a single distilling device, which allows us to chop and change between either a single pot run, a column stripping run, a pure vapor basket run, or any combination of the three. And that kind of flexibility allows us to dive deeper into individual botanicals and the best ways to extract them. So our 200 litre copper pot is heated by an oil jacket. So it's full of vegetable oil, which is literally just heated up, creates an even jacket of heat. Um, we have botanicals in here that are being agitated or stirred by a little agitator motor so that they're consistently moving, stops them from, say, coming into contact with the heating element for too long and burning, allows all of them to keep moving throughout the liquid. Um, we have a low profile helmet on top here, which creates a low profile reflux, which is important for cleaning up some of those early vapors. But ultimately, the, the height of your helmet on top of your still dictates increased or decreased reflux, which means a higher concentrated flavor versus a cleaner distillate. Again, horses to courses. We've gone low and heavy because we like a full, big, bold kind of uh, botanical delivery. And for our run, we basically uh, macerate for 24 hours. We don't heat that up anymore. As we mentioned, we put three of our six botanicals in for a macerate. We add a fourth one the day of distilling. And then we have two more botanicals that basically go into our vapor basket here, which allow us to use the basket to increase aromatics, um, especially our gorse flower. If we put it in our boiler, it would destroy it. It would be too aggressive. So it allows us to aromatically kind of concentrate all those beautiful notes that we talked about, that chamomile and, and sort of uh, dried banana. Um, and, uh, and then once we have a distillate coming out, we can obviously then start playing around with our heart cut. So that's we'll sort of us in a nutshell. We'll get to that. A, a quick question that just came to mind. Yeah. What was, what was your R&D like for this? How many, uh, how many mate, different um, versions did yeah, you make? Yeah, my, my R&D was a three litre um, Portuguese pot sitting on a gas, on a big paella gas heater wow. uh, in my garage for about four years. And um, wow. I went through a single distilled multitude of botanicals to try to just learn about the botanicals, the best ways that they extract, the different methods of maceration, using the whole botanical, cracking it, crushing it, powders. Um, you know, all of these things, vapor baskets versus pot, like everything influences not only the ingredient, but how you want to use it. So. R&D was, was epic. And I think, you know, more and more we're seeing that these days with people talking about their stories. I spent two years, I spent three years developing my recipe because the variables are just so vast. And um, even now we're still being schooled, you know, on a weekly about something, even with our six botanicals that teaches us something newer that we missed or we weren't paying attention to enough. So, you know, I, I had an old um, friend of mine who used to work for Lefroig and um, John Campbell, the distiller there was like, you know, he's been making, I think, 30, 40 years he's been doing Scotch and Isla. But he's like, you can't, you couldn't think of anything more complicated than distilling gin. So it's, you know, it's, it is once you get into the nuances, boy, you can lose yourself in it for sure. So R&D is ongoing. Yeah, the, the, the amount of variables is kind of mind boggling, yeah. particularly when you've got this hybrid, hybrid steel model behind you and then yeah. you've got forage botanicals. The seasonality of your botanicals. The seasonality. Is, and, yeah, yeah. yeah adds, adds an extra level of complexity, um, which um, which is good for the consumer, good for the guests because they're something, getting something packed full of flavour with high production values and, and you know, credibility, which is super, super cool. Um, I want to just pull, pull a few little things out there that you mentioned, the, the heat source, something I guess yeah. a lot of people also don't think about. I'm not sure how much it adds to the, the um, final recipe or how it uh, impacts the distillation of the botanicals. You mentioned oil. So um, I've yeah. heard of steam jackets. I've heard of um, yeah. like boilers using water or, or basically a big electric hot plate. But you use oil. I've never heard of that. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's, it's great. It has, it has uh, one big advantage. It's very easy. It's plug and play. As a heat source, uh, you don't have to deal with a pressure vessel like you do with steam jackets. Um, water jackets are more and more common these days because it deals with a low level of pressure. So again, it's, it's a lot more safer. Um, steam jackets, you still need a steam generator to put steam into the jacket. So for us, literally as a standalone unit, it's filled, say, half up with vegetable oil. Um, when it heats, it expands. But um, there's no worry about it. It's an open vessel, so it's, it's pressure negative, which is very easy 
the con or the issue with that is that it takes a lot longer to get up to heat. And when it gets up to heat, it stays at heat for a long period of time. So you have definitely much less control over perhaps you might want to drop or, or change your temperature throughout a run. And even when we finish the distilling run, it obviously will stay at high heat for a long period of time. So, you know, pros and cons with efficiency, how they influence flavor really comes down to control. You know, direct heat and steam are probably the absolute best you could possibly have because you have real time reaction to temperature fluctuations if you choose to, to do so. So, yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the agitator or the agitation as well. And I straight away go to a bar situation as well. I'm sure you did this yeah. in your bartending career making syrup so even you, you, when you're cooking you have to make sure you stir it so you don't burn yep. certain components make sure you get consistency is that something similar like in your pot yeah i mean it's basically it's a massive swizzle so it's just keeping things stirred i mean one day i might just get drunk enough to decide to make the world's biggest old-fashioned oil that's probably been done <laughs> but you know it would uh yeah it's 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 about keeping the botanicals moving and by even in the maceration process if you're able to keep them moving there's way more interaction with the liquid. You know, you don't get some botanicals that are floating on the top and creating a puck and being too exposed to air. They're constantly moving, getting dipped between the liquids, so they're obviously getting interactive with the with the liquid more often. So it definitely helps with that for sure. So uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of agitators for sure. Great. And you mentioned different botanicals are going through the the process at different stages. What are the botanicals that get macerated uh, versus so we mas thrown in? We macerate. The juniper, the kawakawa berries, um, the uh, coriander seed, um, and then we add the hops the day of. So the remaining two botanicals, which is our gorse, flower, uh, our gorse flowers and our grapefruit peel, go into our basket. And putting putting citrus in the basket is pretty random because most most of the time you'll put it in your boiler and, and macerate it with all the other botanicals. For us, we have the ability to be able to cut in and cut out our basket at any stage through our run. And if the majority of your citrus is coming out in your heads, as we discussed earlier in that lemonine compound, then we find that we lose most of our grapefruit in the early part of our run that we that isn't making it to our hearts. So we cut in the basket as we are approaching our heart cut to redirect the flow into the basket and capture that citrus. It's almost like treating uh, cheating on the chemical extraction point of dominant citrus chemicals. So we yeah do have a bit more sort of creative license with that. Yeah, interesting. Um, the, I guess for some people that might not know, um, citrus is mostly used in dried format and it's been dried for, for maybe years and years before it gets used by a gin distiller, whereas uh, you guys are actually you know, peeling it and then using it um, when it's uh, a lot fresher. Um, I've heard of like Four Pillars, for example, um, they use fresh citrus. Um, they put whole fresh citrus chopped yeah. up in their basket. Yeah, um, yeah make marmalade. Yeah, and then yeah. they make the marmalade, which is great. Or well, I think for pig feed, they use their bar, um, botanicals for it as well, which is pretty fun. Um, okay, yeah, they're cool. I guess it goes back to what we we're talking about with the botanicals and the delicate nature, and you have to approach how you integrate the flavour from each botanical separately because it's different volatile natures or delicate natures of it. Um, so let's go now specifically into the distillation process. Um, yeah. We've talked about you know, different parts of the apparatus and you've got a hybrid still, so it goes through different components. Um, I guess uh, we've talked previously around multi-shot versus single shot versus other you know, compound or blended. I guess maybe it could be helpful to provide some context before we talk about that, um, those different styles and talk about what a distilled gin is. And there might be a little bit of conjecture. We've also spoken previously around uh, there's probably a lack of categorization in the gin category. I know at the Gin Guild in London, it's a it's a big topic that they're constantly talking about. Um, what's your definition based off EU or US uh, definitions of um, the still gin? Yeah, so this this is definitely a one of those deep discussions they have with different brand owners or gin geeks in the world. But um, the still gin has has legal definitions that are quite different between the US and the UK. Or Europe, I should say. So um, here in New Zealand, we we obviously you know tend towards the EU definition because we're part of the Commonwealth. But um, for myself, you know, we we have sort of proudly a, a London dry gin. So we don't add any sugars. Um, we purely have a, a dominant flavour profile of the juniper. We utilise nutra spirit rectification. But um, distilled gin generally is is. For us, it would be using a neutral spirit to redistill juniper um, as a dominant botanical, um, and and that's it. But it doesn't say how you have to distill it. It doesn't say whether um, 
you uh, want to do a multi-shot or a single shot, which basically is putting it all together, distilling it once, capturing it, cutting it, single shot. Multi-shot might be where you decide to do two different runs or three different runs, but distill your botanicals into groups or into individual botanical distillates because you have much more control over a single botanical if you distill it by itself. I know you've got uh, the Kyoto guys in Japan. Um, I think they distill their gin recipes in groups. I think they put their floral together and their citrus together and their earthy together because they extract at kind of group stages on a single run in a, in a, in a shot. So they then take those separate distillates and sort of marry them back together again to make a multi-shot gin. And there's some pretty good arguments on both sides about sort of, you know, the advantages of each. Um, one of the things that I'm a big fan of with single shot gins, apart from the efficiency of it, is, is the fact that um, at a chemical level, again, you are deconstructing flavors into a gas from a liquid and then recombining them back into a liquid in a single run. And in doing so, there's much more um, sort of integration of flavors. You know, when you taste the, the spirit afterwards, each one of those different flavor chemicals have bound into one homogenous flavor. If you distill them independently and then use marrying or blending to pull your flavors together, it takes a lot longer for them to, to blend and a, or to cohesively kind of talk. And, and the example I use is an old fashioned, you know, we all understand how well a beautiful old fashioned tastes when it's made right. You can take the exact volumes and ingredients of an old fashioned and throw them into a glass and it doesn't work. It's the exact same final liquid, but it doesn't work unless it's given the time for those flavors and those different viscosities to kind of like melt. So for me, single shot, multi shot, it can definitely be done well, but it, you kind of have to take that extra time to leave it to marry together into a uniform flavor. So um, I guess my, my definition is a little bit different. Um, sorry, around the one shot, single shot, multi shot. So single shot, um, there's a bit of debate about it that I've, I've heard about. And like, I'm not a, I'm not a distiller. Um, I drink, I make martinis and I drink a lot of martinis. But the single shot is what you just described, what we're talking about. It's probably the most quote unquote authentic and um, purest form of gin distillation. Now you've got hybrid stills, so it goes through some different elements, but basically you're doing the same thing. And the single shot refers to uh, having a botanical recipe, macerating, distilling, and then um, cutting with demineralized de water to get to your bottling strength. And you and what you just described is perfect. There's a romantic notion around you're not doing anything else to it. You're just capturing the botanicals. You're capturing that that art of distillation. The only thing you're adding to it is just water to get it down to the optimal ABV for drinking and cocktails and whatnot. Whereas multi-shot gins that we work with, for example, Widges, which is which has got my uh, name and face on it, is a multi-shot gin. And, and they, uh, they, get, they do a, a concentrate, basically. I refer to it as a concentrate when I'm talking to guests because I find it's the best way for me to describe it. It's about one to 10 ratio. And so instead of yeah. using yeah. mineralized water, they're putting in more neutral grain spirit and then water. And so I also take, say to guests that it's actually kind of, there's an equivalency perhaps to blended scotch where they're actually taking single malt scotch which has got the heritage, it's got the production values, it's got the, the raw materials, whether it's malt, barley, peat. But then their blend is then cutting it with some grain whiskey to kind of bulk out the volume to create still a really good product and then demineralize water. Whereas gin is taking those raw materials, um, that distillation process, the art, the science, the, the mystery, mm. and then mm. just cutting it with water, capturing it out that's a bit more authentic versus cutting with neutral grain spirit. I haven't heard anyone that says that either is worse, better or worse than the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I really, as a purist, I really do like the concept of a single shot though. Um, yeah. yeah. But, but um, cause it's, a, it's got an, an element of craft to it and, and more of an artis, artisanal approach to it. Um, I did um, read a, a short a video of someone else talking about the same topic. And they said uh, they did a, a test between a single shot and a multi-shot, same recipe. Um, the judging panel couldn't tell the difference really between the distillates, um, but the big difference was that um, from the same same distillation, the single shot could make 500 bottles from the same recipe and distillation. If it's a multi-shot, they could make if it was a one to 35 recipe, they could make 14,000. Yeah, yeah. So it's a commercial decision, clearly as well. Yeah, it is. And the um, I mean, for me, we've always sort of regarded that 
that hyper concentration where you make an essential oil from a single botanical or a group of botanicals and then rehydrate it with say water and neutral spirit to make it go bigger we've always called that compound distilling so that's where you're creating a compound of a concentrated flavor profile to later hydrate into larger volumes so i've got a, a someone else i know who has a, still the same size but he puts 15 times his botanical recipe in one run to create this hyper concentrated recipe that they then rehydrate with neutral spirit and water to make 15 times the volume. So I'd call that a compound gin, but then if he did that with one single shot run, that's a single shot compound. If he'd done it by splitting his botanicals into two different groups and individually distilling them and then rehydrating it, that would be a multi-shot compound. So um, again, I may have my, my own definition different on that one, but that's why we've always described, you know, the compound is a concentrate that's rehydrated later for larger volume of use. And then single shot is kind of like an honest expression at the exact level you want to put in your bottle. Um, there's definitely massive advantage of the compounding and there's some bloody great gins that are compounds. So uh, I'm very much on the fence about, you know, whether one is better than the other because I'm an old school bartender purist, you know, I've gone straight down this bloody expensive labor intensive, you know, uh, sort of route, but it's something we understand and it's something that we can control ourselves. So, it's sort of the way we're sticking with it as a so, so when you when you open up 50 new markets you're just gonna you're just gonna keep building those 200 liter stills yeah yeah again <laughs> I think we were joking about this the other day but you know definitely created a, a a brand for a for a bartender as well where you know I took all the things that excite me spent the time on the botanicals you know choosing things that are wild forage is great for marketing but my god it's the worst thing for scalability so our tiny little awesome 200 liter she's going to have to grow at some point so we do have an expansion plan in the works to add another larger still larger production area our distillery is literally operated inside two 44 sugar containers so we definitely warehousing is a is an issue as well but um it's kind of part of our story it's part of our journey yeah. and uh, we definitely don't have all the answers yet but if we get to a point where we aren't big enough but our volume and demand is required that becomes a problem worth having so oh, that's, that's exciting yeah. um I guess, uh, so that's great um, to talk about that multi-shot versus single shot. I guess uh, another question is, uh, what, what are some random and unexpected elements of gin distillation or being a gin distiller have you come across? What are some challenges and what are some little yeah. quirky things that you wouldn't have thought about? Oh, we, are, we are constantly being schooled, as I've mentioned earlier, even just for our six botanicals. And so, you know, from creating roots from the beginning, I was a big believer in the gins that have less botanicals, but have those less botanicals express more. Mm -hmm. um, and even with that, you know, we're dealing with seasonality, we're dealing with um, the best ways to control a consistent product throughout so many variable changes. Even if you're macerating, you know, the temperature of the ambient, um, you know, room or space you're macerating in winter versus summer is going to change the way flavors interact. But for us, it, it, for me, it's business, you know, it's, it's learning to be both a director and a distiller and a and a bar geek, you know. So constantly changing these hats, trying to find a way of controlling your multi-personality disorder. Um, but now we're in a stage, you know, two and a half years in, we've got some great traction, we've got some great followability. We are hoping, you know, very excited about launching into Australia next year with you guys. Um, yeah, scalability is going to be a big part of it. So how are we going to continue to harvest gorse flowers? How are we going to continue to hand peel grapefruit? Um, and all of these things that come with it. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably our, our biggest learning and our biggest challenge. Um, but it's also something which you kind of, it's like, like working in hospital, it's masochistic, isn't it? Because it's hard work, crap pay, long hours, but we love it and we thrive on it. So it's definitely yeah. a bit of that happening here as well. And, you know, the, those challenges and, you know, that, um, that growth will, will breed innovation and will breed, breed creativity. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. By the fact that you're putting on parties and putting on barbecues for people to come and peel your grapefruit or go forage for yeah. those, that's an example of like, okay, how do I bring community into this? How do I do it en masse? How do I do it when I need to do it? Um, and I'm sure you'll figure that out with all your other production and awesome. expansion plans and stuff like that. Um, Thanks, mate. I think, yeah, it's been great to talk to you. I think we'll probably wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, you too, now. man. Real um, pleasure, Jason. Yeah, you need to get back to uh, get back to the still, so to speak. Um, I'm probably going to stay here and make some drinks. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been great to talk to you. Um, I've really found it useful, um, educational. Um, uh, I really enjoy the the combination of talking about how we can talk about botanicals in a flavour perspective, but now on a chemical level, and how do we apply that into the bar, or how do we apply that when we're talking to a customer as a supplier, yeah. as a distributor. Um, 
as a bartender and everything in between. And it's good to know how you guys do something different um, with your distilling um, techniques. So really appreciate your time and um, thanks for connecting and see you soon. Yeah, real pleasure, guys. And thanks, everyone. Keep drinking, keep exploring, keep discovering. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Everyone. See you, man.